Hello guys, welcome to Daddy Share Space and welcome to my channel and welcome to this episode of Daddy Share Space Daily. So I'm just looking over some of the questions and comments that I got on my video and I just wanted to uh, address a couple of them. One of those comments is someone asked me about having a shed outside and um, it's actually an excellent idea. However, uh, the issue that I found with having a shed here in California, one thing you have to be aware of is that anything over 10 by 10 has to have a permit. That's one. And then obviously that can lead to increase in property taxes. That's an issue if that's something that you're concerned about. Um, the other thing is too, uh, I did have an idea that I wanted to build like say a temporary shed and that uh, something that basically like where I would build like four walls that actually could uh, bolt together and then unbolt so you can just kind of like lean it up against the side of a wall when you're not in use and it would actually have a roof that could be uh, erected or um, taken down. I always have these crazy ideas that go through my head and um, different things that what I felt like that would do is it would help me with some basic construction ideas and concepts but then also um, if these walls were on, say, some form of caster system, I could, uh, you know, roll them up and lean them up against, like, say, the side of the house when it was not in use and then uh, somehow prop up the roof, you know, maybe just have more like a lean to type roof. So you would um, maybe have the four pieces of the, the four walls and the roof would like kind of fold down when it's not in use. And then you would kind of lift it up like with a stick and then pull the other wall around to hold it all up. I know it's a convoluted idea, but the reason why I thought like that was simply because when you have limited space in your yard, um, you may not always want that space allocated to uh, something like a shed. That's one. Number two, um, I've come to find like even within the garage, sometimes you come up with an idea you think is great and then down the line you want to change it. And that was the reason why I was thinking of more of a transformable solution. However, um, these days we have to be concerned about a lot of things. And one of those things that we have to be concerned about is, you know, i.e. property taxes on homes and then also home insurance. And um, I'm not a person that actually has to experience a car wreck to know that it's not a good idea or something that I don't want to be a part of. And I'm hearing from different places uh, across the Internet and from different states and uh, that basically insurance companies are actually flying drones over people's homes and looking at things like brush, trees, um, extra rubbish, anything like that that's near the home, empty swimming pools, and they are canceling insurance policies based upon uh, these criteria. And so you want to be very mindful about anything you're going to do in regards to uh, the property that you either own or that you're living in. And so with that in mind, it made me kind of retract and decide that since I was not a hundred percent sure about like where I would want to put a shed, even if it was under the specs of 10 by 10, even if it was somewhat temporary, um, you know, all the investment that would go into it. Uh, and then, you know, also too, you, you always have to always be mindful of like, you may have uh, neighbors around you that may be annoyed with what you're doing or be a little bit more, um, uh, over involved in your business and thus forth that can cause you some extra issues I try my best to minimize contact with my neighbors in the sense of you know causing them any kind of issues or problems and you just never know especially if you don't know your neighbors very well you don't know what's going to set them off so I like to stay within my own realm if you will and make sure that whatever I'm doing on the property that I'm on, on my property, is not uh, inf in infecting or causing any issues with the surrounding neighbors. Now, I wish they always would feel that way about me, but that's not always the case. However, um, you know, it's a Christian thing to do, to do unto others as you would have them do unto you and not necessarily retaliate or reciprocate what they may be doing to you. And so the other thing is um, this past season, we had uh, the planter boxes up and we got really, really strong winds and it was blowing all the plants over. And so that's another thing. Uh, uh, it could be a state code 
or a county code is when you build a structure like that, it needs to be hard fastened to the ground. And that's so obviously it doesn't blow over or blow into your neighbor's yard or cause any issues like that. I actually know of someone who had one of those car canopies um, put on their property. I don't know if they did it themselves or if they had it professionally done, but when we got strong winds, it actually blew over into someone else's yard. And that person actually lives on a, a degree of acreage. So that kind of gives you an idea of how powerful those winds were. And that wasn't super far from where I am located here in Sacramento so that being said you have to keep all these things into consideration and um, that kind of leads into you know one of the reasons why I bought a rotary hammer because that was when I realized that hey if you're going to be putting up say structures whether temporary or permanent there are times when you may need to um, like either pour some degree of foundation, whether it be a pillar foundation or block foundation, and you need to have anchor bolts in that to anchor whatever it is, whether it be a small shed or whatever, to the ground so that, you know, like I said, it doesn't end up in the neighbor's yard or damage someone, your own or someone else's property. So these are just things that you just have to keep in mind when you start talking about adding physical structures to uh, your uh, property. And you know, that's one of the things like I've had uh, plenty of discussions with my wife about possibly moving um, somewhere more rural where we have a little bit more space between, you know, our house and someone else's house. Um, it's not something that I considered years ago. I mean, it's kind of like you, as you get older, you, you learn, you grow, you develop, and you, you see things from a different light. And so like, whereas before I thought nothing about living closer to people and now I can't stop thinking about living further away, um, not because I'm anti people, but because if you have a little bit more space, you have the capacity to do a lot more things. You know, I, if, if it was within my power and I had enough space, I would build a workshop from the ground up. I mean, I know I don't have um, a1 construction skills or anything like that but it wouldn't stop me from trying and I would build an independent garage for my auto mechanic repairs and stuff like that because it, it just seems logical to me to do things like that but in order to do that you have to have land you have to have property most of the conventional homes that we would buy are already set up in subdivisions and in neighborhoods that don't allow for this kind of flexibility. They don't really allow for like DIY. I remember uh, when my wife first came to this country and I was telling her, you know, you kind of have to make a decision on if you want to live in a home or if you want to live in an apartment because it's a different type of lifestyle um, in the sense that like if you live in an apartment, more than likely you're not going to be able to work on your car legally on those premises. You're not going to have outdoor space for things. You're not going to be building and doing stuff like that. And so you're really limited to the um, what the the bylaws of that facility is. And so that could mean that you may need to spend more money on automobiles because, you you know, it's not going to benefit you to have a car broke down in the in the parking lot of an apartment. And in many cases, that could cause your car to be towed. So that would prompt you to go buy a newer vehicle, which means which leads to higher insurance costs. So even though living in an apartment has a degree of convenience to it in the sense that like you can pick up and go whenever and a lot of the maintenance of the yard and even like the plumbing and all of that stuff is managed by the property uh, management company uh, sometimes they're good sometimes they're not but there are many limitations. You need to live within that small segment. You don't have a lot of outdoor space, maybe a patio, maybe a little uh, plot of land, you know, like if it's a townhouse, but you don't have a lot of room for, you know, you don't have really any room for auto repair. If you decided you wanted to do some DIY woodworking projects, even though I've seen some people that will go out on their patio in an apartment and, and be doing stuff like maker type stuff, that is not like, typically the rule you know I mean even something like that would be more I would say in more of a rural state as a pool as opposed to like a more populous state like California um, you know like 
when I lived in the Midwest in Kansas, there's a lot more flexibility by comparison to California. It's a it's a lot more of a regulated area. And so you have to keep that in mind. And in order to have a lot more freedom and a lot more flexibility, you actually have to be making a ton of money. And uh, for myself personally, personal financial choices that I've made, uh, I made the decision to live well below my means. So it gives me a lot more uh, financial flexibility to do a lot of, to try a lot of different things because um, you know at least in this country who knows how long you're going to be able to work and stay employed at any point in time you could be terminated or you could be laid off from your job so you always have to be mindful of you know unfortunate events like that and keep in mind that you know you should always be working on other things that may be able to help your future both now and into the future and unfortunately, I don't really feel like in this country that we really focus a lot on uh, financial literacy. Uh, I, I know I didn't learn it in school. You know, back in 2008, 2009, I went through my own personal financial disaster, um, which changed my mind about a lot of things about how I deal with money. At that time, I had credit. I had, you know, two motorcycles financed, a home financed in the Midwest. I had an apartment in downtown LA. I was a travel nurse at that time, but I was spread so thin. I had credit cards, all of these things. And one motorcycle accident really changed my whole perspective on everything because that motorcycle accident just happened to happen at the time of the economic downturn from 2008, which meant that I spent an extended period of time off work, which caused me to get underwater in my finances in so many different areas. And once I finally was able to recover from that, I just kind of made my mind up that I didn't want to get over leveraged like that anymore. That's why I pretty much swore off of buying new cars. Um, you know, the only thing that I really find that's acceptable to get in debt for is really a home. However, at the same time, you know, if I have a gun to my head and I have to get a newer vehicle, then, you know, that's what I would have to do. But even now, you know, I bought my 2003 Dodge Ram truck probably I'm like 10, 11 years ago, but I only paid $5,500 for it, cash and carry, right? The Saab that I bought that I've been working on trying to nurse back to health, I paid $2,000 for that about 13 years or so ago at cash and carry. So I'm out of pocket for the course of like 10 years or more for like $7,500. That's not including any kind of repairs or tires that I had to, you know, do with the vehicles, but that's a lot of money saved because when you look at, if you just do a simple Google search, it says that the average car price right now is about $700 a month. And I've heard plenty of stories about people paying upwards of $1,200, $1,400 a month for one car payment. And then imagine the insurance costs attached to that. It's just debilitating. I mean, it really takes away all of your flexibility to be able to do anything that you may want to do in life. So, um, you know, for me personally, my economic failure changed my mindset and put me in the mindset of like, okay, I need to take uh, smaller steps forward and I also need to see what gives me multiple benefits. It's kind of like, you know, you can buy a car and a car is fine. But if you buy a truck, though it costs more gas to drive it, it gives you a lot more flexibility if you need to transport things, whether it be um, if you need to say you buy a new couch, it's easier to transport that couch in a truck than it is in a car. You don't have to pay those extra fees because, you know, I look at renting vehicles very similar to like renting an apartment. It can get very, very pricey really fast. And so, you know, if you can go buy you a cheap, inexpensive truck for about two, three, four, five thousand dollars, and if that's only if you have some kind of mechanic skills to either make sure it's running properly and keep it running properly, you're gonna save way more money in the long run as opposed to going out and putting like signing your name to like a fifty thousand, sixty thousand dollar car or something like that. Now I know you can get cars that are cheap cheaper than that. However, the way that things are being produced these days, you know, and you talking about everything's like a la carte, right? You can from cell phones to cars to, you know, any kind of thing, even food, you know, you can 
pay as little as you want and as much as you want, but the value is not always there. The top end is not always the best value. And so, but unfortunately, the way that I feel like companies at this time are trying to basically expand their you know, uh, quarter over quarter earnings is by essentially they have offering A and they figure out ways through um, legalese or contracts, you know, in EULAs or in end user license agreements to basically uh, pull back on resources that you were already paying for, right? That's why you hear about things like, I can't remember which car brand, but they decided to try to have a subscription model for heated seats and vehicles. You know, I mean, it, things are getting pretty ridiculous right now. Everything's like a continual payment over and over and over again. And I cannot argue with that mindset because you think back many years ago and a person would, you know, spend a lot of money for, say, like a John Deere tractor. And it was a known brain brand. It was reputable. And back then it was reliable. But then if John Deere sells you a tractor, let's say 20, 30 years ago, and it's so good that you don't have to buy another tractor for basically your lifetime right? That doesn't help John Deere in the long run. I'm just using John Deere as an example. I'm not trying to badmouth any company. It could be company A or company B. But what happens is they have employees that they need to pay and those employees want raises. You've got people at Boeing right now on strike because they want raises. They want cost of living raises. However, our economic system, it really... Um, I don't have a, I'm not intelligent enough to come up with a better system, but our system is, you know, essentially a failure in the sense that um, you, we call it capitalism. And it's not that I'm anti-capitalist. It's just if everybody was the same, had the same level of intelligence, we would have to resort to hostility and violence to take advantage of one another. And in some cases that does happen. But right now, what we depend on in a capitalist society is the ignorance of the consumer. And I am a consumer and I've been ignorant on many different fronts in so many different ways because I didn't understand, you know, the value of the dollar. I didn't understand the value of my signature. I didn't understand, you know, debt and credit and um, uh, APRs. And as a result, I paid a heavy price for that. I mean, globally, overall in life, I am well behind where I should be at this time, but that's because I was not financially literate. And that's not to say that, oh, I've got it now and I'm financially literate. That's just saying that, you know, there was a time when I was more illiterate than I am today. And so now with every decision and choice I make, with the exception of the fact that, you know, I do play video games sometimes. So, you know, I just recently bought a an expensive gaming console. Matter of fact, two very recently um, we did as a household. You know, that's not the most responsible financial decision. However, when I, you know, for me, a something like that, right? And I know that gaming is changing a great deal. It's changing before our eyes because they're trying to move us away from physical media altogether. Um, but what I what I realize, and I've, I've talked with my wife about this on many occasions. If you gave me a choice on whether I wanted to spend, let's say, three thousand dollars on a vacation to go wherever, you know, I could go in the country. Uh, or or outside of the country to travel on a vacation trip for me personally I would rather take that money and spread it out over the course of the year and have more things to do on a day in and day out basis than basically wait for like say a one week or two week vacation um, you know that costs so much money um, I learned a long time ago when I first became a registered nurse, I purchased a 2003 Dodge Ram. No, 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 no. When I first became, sorry, I'm thinking about my truck. When I first became a registered nurse, I purchased a 2003 BMW 325XI. And I thought that, you know, I had arrived for whatever reason. I felt like because I had gotten my degree that um, I deserved something better. And I quickly learned that there's a difference between being able to buy something and being able to afford something. Being able to buy something means that some 
somebody will agree to let you sign on the dotted line for a certain payment, being able to afford something means that if you buy said thing, you can also maintain it over the long term. You're seeing that as you see in this become a problem uh, today in the housing market in the sense that people are scrounging together and putting money together to put down payments on homes that they are actually having to sell like a year or or more later, you know, really in a very short time after they buy it because they didn't consider the fact that taxes and insurance can go through the roof. You know, I learned that lesson a long time ago when I purchased my first home in Kansas. It, uh, the taxes on that home when I first bought it were like about 598 or so dollars a year. Now the home I bought was for all intents and purposes, you know, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure I got the contract somewhere around here cause I don't throw stuff away, but um, it was an APR, you know, a, a flex, uh, what do you call it? A, um, not a fixed rate mortgage. It was a adjustable rate APR type mortgage. And so as a result, the payment, you know, went from one price and it went up half over time. But um, the thing is with that mortgage, so the property that I bought, it, it could still, it basically was, it needed a lot of work. It was not a very nice house. It was a house. It was four walls. It had a roof. It didn't leak, um, but it has meaning the roof didn't leak, but it, it, it was not a pristine turnkey home. And so um, even though it was extremely inexpensive, what I realized was, especially with the income that I was making at that time, I think I was only making like $8 an hour as a uh, certified nurse's assistant in nursing school. And so it was very difficult. I could not secure any kind of loan to fix the home up, even though I had equity in the home. Um, you just start to realize that in our financial system, in order to move ahead, it's almost like they loan money to people who don't need money in our system. So if you don't need money, then why take it? Because what what happens is kind of like you're gambling because let's say even if you can't afford to take a loan, if you have any kind of snafu in your life, any kind of problem, then that may quickly turn and then you can't afford it. And then you file, find yourself in financial disaster like I did back in 2008. So um, I feel like you know, when it comes to like moving forward for myself personally, you know, I keep reiterating, you know, like here on Daddy Share Space, this is an opportunity for me to try to, um, I guess, in my own way, create my own type of business, if you will. I see so many people that do podcasts, that do, you know, they may talk about current events, they may, you know, react to videos, and there are people out there legitimately making an income probably comparable to what I make on my job and even more. And so I see that as an opportunity here on YouTube. And I, you know, really believe in that mindset of nothing beats a failure, but a try. And even if I am to fail uh, terribly here on YouTube, even if all the money I spent buying tools and doing the things that I've done um, does not pan out and does not produce uh, the kind of revenue that I would like, the benefit is I did not do it buying a whole bunch of um, disposable um, things that get outdated through updates, i.e. like cell phones and computers. Um, I My mind has completely shifted when it comes to electronic devices. I see them for what they are. Um, a gaming system, even if it's $500, $600, as I said before, given the example of a vacation, if I wanted to go to Paris, I probably could not go. I mean, because remember, I am not a single man and I do not, I am not childless. I have a wife and I have three daughters. So that means if I want to go to Paris, I, we all go to Paris. And so, uh, whereas if I go spend $700 on a console, which gives me the ability to play today, tomorrow, the next day, over the course of the year and my children can play it, my wife can play it. Um, it may not be the same thing as going to Paris, but um, if all I can do is go to Paris for one week and I can't do anything else for the rest of the year, my personal choice is I wouldn't make that decision. I wouldn't do that. So 
Um, I like to do things that give me some kind of value or return daily, something that I can visit daily, i.e. like, you know, whether it be a video game, whether it be anything that I could do here that's within uh, my budget range. Um, as far as like I said about the tools, getting back on that, even if this YouTube thing just completely blows up in my face like a stick of dynamite, um, there are people uh, just to give you reference that I have seen on YouTube, they live in the Arizona high desert. They bought property for extremely cheap and they are building out their own little homesteads and such. And a lot of them started off with way less tools than I have. So, you know, the way I feel about it is if, if you know, things really hit the wall. You know, as long as I keep enough money to to pack a to to rent a U-Haul truck and and move myself to something like the Arizona high desert and buy a piece of land where I can kind of you know do my own thing, every single one of these tools that I have will come into play and be very 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 beneficial. It's it's almost like um, doomsday prepping, if you will. I mean, sure, it would be nice to be so wealthy that. I could afford to pay someone to do everything I needed done and that I could just enjoy my life, go travel around the world, go on cruises and vacation. That would be lovely. But unfortunately, I don't make that kind of money. And I also am not willing to get knee deep in debt to live that lifestyle. Many people around me, I see, you know, making these choices daily, trying to keep up with the Joneses, trying to fit in. I don't I mean, I've never fit in my whole life and I'm not trying to do it now. You know, I mean, I I try my best to be as independent as I can to stand on my own two feet. And that's just how I live, you know, and um, I, I personally am in search of other people like that because people like that will help inspire me and strengthen my position by giving me new ideas of things that I haven't considered. Because as I said, I'm learning financial literacy. You know, when I look at our system and the way we do things and the way, uh, you know, like even talking about Wall Street and how that works, you know, uh, for me, a lot of things that I see in our society, in our world, is like the emperor has no clothes. And what I mean by that, when you think about stocks just on the foundational level, sure, you can make money doing that. There's no doubt about it. You can. I've seen it. I've even experienced it myself. But at the end of the day, what it comes down to is, you know, I sell you a stock in my company. If I do well, right, you make money. But if I fail, you lose all of your money. You lose all of your investment. And then let's say, you know, I buy a stock from you in your company and I pay a hundred dollars and then, you know, you're making poor decisions or whatever. And so the value of your company is going down. Now I have a choice to either short sale or just lose all my money. Or what I can do is bring in some other uneducated individual and sell to them. And then it's a game of hot potato. And, you know, being a Christian person and trying to live up to a standard of loving your neighbors yourself, I cannot in good conscience uh, do someone else like that. I can't knowingly do someone like that simply because I know that I wouldn't want someone to do me like that. So it makes my life extremely difficult. And that's why I push myself so hard, because if I don't earn it, it can't be done in my mind. If, if, if the idea of me doing better has to do with me stepping on somebody else's back or causing someone else harm or, or um, misleading someone else, it's off the table for me, even if it's going to benefit me and my family simply because I know the difference between right and wrong. And I do not want that to happen to me, even though I know it's going to. But the reality is I'm trying to put out in the world what I want back. And when I meet people that have that mentality, the mentality of what I would call a taker, a user, you know, I just try my best with all that I can to isolate and insulate myself from people like that so that I can minimize the negative fallback because it's not just me anymore. I have a wife and daughters to consider. And so anyone that comes to me to try to um, take from me or mislead me is not just hurting me, they're hurting my wife and they're hurting my children. And being the man of my household, I am supposed to stand up for them. And so that's what I intend to do. 
Anyways, guys, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this video, and I will see you in my next one. Take care.